Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. My name is Scott Peterkin. I'm a partner at Bernice Paul, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to our Pushing Your Limits online event. I'm going to make some introductions to our guests, and I'll explain what the format of the session is shortly. But first, just a few housekeeping points, please. Um, as we've got over 300 people signed up for the event, please could you remain on mute throughout. Um, secondly, there will hopefully be an opportunity to answer a selection of your questions at the end of the session. So if you have any questions uh, at all, please enter them in the Zoom chat function. And finally, I know how busy everyone is, so we'll have a hard stop at 6 p.m. this evening. So on to introductions. Uh, firstly, Mark Bowman. Mark's made a career of world firsts and breaking records, traveling to over 130 nations and territories and doing so. He's made documentaries over 15 years, as well as publishing five books. Having cycled around the world twice, he now holds the 18,000 mile record in 78 days and 14 hours, achieving the famous around the world in 80 days for the first time by bicycle. Off the bike, these record-breaking journeys have been through the high Arctic, mountaineering and ocean rowing, including surviving capsize in the mid-Atlantic. Mark was awarded a British Empire Medal on, in the Queen's New Year's Honours for contributions to sport and charity. Mark's background is also in business and economics, and a little known fact is that his first temp job after graduating was with Burness at 50 Lothian Road in Edinburgh. In 2015, Mark set the inaugural record on the North Coast 500 of 37 hours before James McCallum came along to challenge this a few years later, and more about that to follow. With over 20 years of experience in cycling, Jimmy McCallum has seen it all. Firstly, as an athlete with multiple British and Scottish championships across multi-disciplines on road and track cycling. He topped that off with four Commonwealth Games representations and a Commonwealth Games bronze medal in 2006. Not only that, but he completed the North Coast 500, North Coast 500 in under 29 hours non-stop to beat Mark's record by some margin, so no tension here. Since retiring from international racing after Glasgow 2014, his pathways led to performance coaching and director sportive duties with One Pro Cycling and WNT. He now leads Scotland's most ambitious cycling project at the cyclingacademy.com. Jimmy is still an avid competitor and believes in practicing what he preaches. His passion for athlete development and the sport of cycling led him to join the Scottish Cycling Board as the athlete representative. Jimmy's British Cycling qualified as well as a level four strength and con conditioning coach and he dedicates his passion and knowledge to athletes across the full spectrum of the sport. He's also been instrumental in arranging the route, pro riders and coordinating all matters cycling for us at our annual Grand, Grand Fondo event, which a number of you will have attended when we are allowed to do such things. Those days will come again. So why are we doing this this year? Well, sadly, we're obviously unable to guarantee that we can host an in-person cycling event later this year. And we wanted to do something a wee bit different to a talk about law or sector related subjects and focus on how lockdown has tried and tested us all, but particularly how it's affected athletes like Jimmy and Mark and to get some insights from them that might be useful to our daily lives, both work and social. So this is intended to be entertaining and fun and I'll keep my chat to a minimum. There's no set script and it's intended to be a free flowing conversation. Also, bike and puppy thefts are through the roof. Uh, neither are pleasant, but both provide hard evidence of an accelerated trend towards a more outdoors lifestyle for many brought about by lockdown, which ultimately is a good thing. Will that tr trend continue after it ends? And I'm also keen that this is uplifting at a time of year when we need it most, as we come out of an incredibly tough year and look forward to some better times and a possible reshaping of personal priorities having had time to contemplate what those are for each of us as individuals. We've all no doubt discovered new things about who we are and where we live during lockdown. And now we can travel further afield. I wanted to set this discussion against the background of the North Coast 500, which is something Jimmy and Mark have in common, as I mentioned. I'd love to do the route this summer, uh, possibly not as quickly as our guests have. And I've certainly been inspired to think more of these types of domestic adventures near to home over lockdown, rather than an overseas trip to somewhere like Majorca. But that does sound quite nice given the temperatures here at the moment. 
So this evening's subject touches on the sporting side of a lot of what we've experienced in our daily lives over lockdown. Issues around motivation, resilience, performance, leadership, goal setting, and I'm keen to see what comparisons you may be able to draw from some of Jimmy's and Mark's experiences of pushing their limits in your own lives. And this all coincides neatly with Mental Health Awareness Week and strikes a chord with the established benefits of spending time outdoors. So just in terms of format, I'll ask Mark and Jimmy to say a wee bit more about themselves. Uh, then there'll be discussion amongst the three of us for about 15 to 20 minutes or so. And in discussion beforehand, we agreed that agreeing with each other was bad. So there may be a bit of playing devil's advocate here. You don't want to hear the three of us just agreeing with each other. We're all quite different characters. And if there's any disagreement at all, the last thing we agreed on is that we won't fall out about it. There'll be an opportunity for questions and answers before we stop at 6 p.m. So if you have any, please do put them into the chat function by text. So at this point, I'll pass over to Jimmy. Wow, uh, Scott, thank you for that fantastic introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, I am Jimmy. I'm the man behind the Grand Fondo. Uh, and then hopefully that some of the people who are joining our chat have experienced what a fantastic day that we've managed to do along in partnership with Ernest Paul. It's definitely grown from strength to strength over the last two or three years we've done it. And I cannot wait to do it in Mallorca, Scott. But um, no, thank you for the great introduction. There's not really much else I can add to that. I don't think there's too much tension between Mark and I, so we should have a really nice chat. So over to Mark. Cheers, Jimmy. Um, well, I'm acutely aware that not everyone, I think we've got 200 people uh, on the Zoom call now. Not everyone will be bike riders or love life on two wheels like uh, the three people on your screen. So I definitely want to make this hour engaging, um, hopefully inspiring and, and entertaining, whatever your interests. But uh, I know the commonality with most people on the call is that we live in Scotland and we've got a connection to the outdoors and we've had more reasons than ever to spend time with our families and you know miss other social groups over the last year. So hopefully we can have a conversation which overlaps uh, not just our work, but uh, you know our families and the communities which we're, we're, a, we're a part of as well. And as Scott joked about in the introduction, uh, I first met the team at Burness Paul when I'd graduated from Glasgow University with a perfectly useful economics and politics degree. And I thought, well, if I'm going to really make a, a go of being an athlete, I have to move away from Glasgow where it's all about my social life and my friends. And I need to move to Edinburgh where I don't know anyone and really knuckle down to training hard for my first cycle around planet Earth. So I walked into a temp agency and uh, the, ne the very next day they started me at uh, 50 Lothian Road. And I walked in and I was put in the, in the, in the back office to do the photocopying. Uh, I think there was probably a lot more photocopying 15, 20 years ago than there is now. And, uh, and, and basically running the, the tea trolley. I don't know if you've still got that. But I remember telling the partners and anyone who cared to listen that I was off to cycle around the world. And some entertained the thought and some just saw me as a graduate who had this crazy idea. And you can quite imagine somebody who is 22 years old um, starting as a temp job in an office with this grand idea to break a Guinness World Record, create a BBC documentary. There's no reference point for that. It's an utterly random conversation. So I really, really enjoyed chatting to the team there and then keeping in touch with them over the years, coming back to do some events since then and um, reflecting to you know the, the the chores and tasks and the teams that I worked with, you know, as my very first office job, uh, graduating with this grand plan to pedal around the planet. So I've I've literally kept in touch with the team ever since, and it's been good fun. I certainly remember that. Um, the last time I saw you was in the mailroom, and the next time I saw you was in the BBC documentary around the world. So uh, yeah, it was uh, it was quite phenomenal. Um, Jimmy, I was going to ask you that you, you spent uh, the high point of your career racing road races that were a fifth of the distance of the North Coast 500. So what made you take on that challenge? That's a very good question. It's definitely not something I would have contemplated when I was a bike racer. And when I decided to ha have a go at it, every single person that I worked with previously and I was working with at the time, they're like, you're absolutely mental. What are you actually doing? There's no chance you'll do that because that's not what you do because... As an athlete, I was a, a short distance, like town centre, town centre criterium rider or a track rider, but I would still race uh, in like multi-day races uh, in like in Europe and in Asia over up to 10, 15 days. So the main reason and the main catalyst was um, that 
I, I lost my sister-in-law to uh, a thrombosis. She had went for an operation in the hospital and it didn't go quite to plan. And unfortunately, she died from a thrombosis. So uh, it's kind of part of my um, process of dealing with that loss and also to help the family as well, because we I, I researched all different kinds of charities and Thrombosis UK did not have any government support at all. And when I phoned them and told them that I was going to try and raise £20,000 for them, the phone just literally went dead because that was then, they had the capability of potentially having another one, maybe two members of staff working on the, on, on the, on the hotlines or helping put information on the internet about how uh, thrombosis can really affect more people than we actually realise. And then I thought to myself, I need to have a challenge, which is absolutely ridiculous that the time frame isn't that big, relatively speaking. So it's not like over a month or a week, because I was still working full time with one pro, so I was travelling around the world at the same time. And suddenly I came across this video of Mark and, and Mark's always been an, a, an amazing pioneer when it comes to um, challenges like this. And, and I, I remember to kind of jump forward a little bit, I remember some of those mornings when I was getting up at like four in the morning to try and ride four or five hours before I started working. And I would go on YouTube and I would type in Mark, Mark Beaumont NC500 and I would watch Mark's 10, 15 minute video of him doing the North Coast 500. And I was watching it and I was watching it and I kept on remembering the part when Mark was uh, in the middle of the night and he was just saying, keep awake, keep awake, keep awake. And it was, the day he did it was horrible. It was freezing cold, middle of winter, Baltic. I did the summer solstice because I like to like she's the head of a wee bit now and then. <laughs> but uh, Mark basically scared me, the fact that it looked so difficult. And I thought, well, if there's one thing that I could do, it's so far away from what I would usually do as an athlete. It's, it's a massive effort. And it's probably the one thing that I can do because it is so mental to really get a lot of attention and try and raise all that cash for, for, um, for charity. And fortunately, we, we got it done. It was an amazing experience. It's a beautiful part of the world, one of the most beautiful parts of the world that I've ever ridden my bike in. And to be able to do it uh, with the day that I had in the summer solstice and have such a great community around about me from people who I've never even met sending well wishes and social media being what it is nowadays, it was, it was a brilliant thing. But for me, it was ultimately... Um, part of that process really to kind of help family mend themselves and 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 pull everyone together for, for the greater good. Uh, Mark, obviously the North Coast 500 is one of the things that connects you, you and Jimmy. Um, can, can you maybe each tell us a wee bit about your experience in preparing for your respective solo rides? Yeah, so I was, um, I, I, I first rode it in 2015. Um, I think I've been around it three times now. And um, I was training actually at the Sir Chris Hoy Velodrome in Glasgow uh, one day a week in the build up to trying to smash the Cairo to Cape Town world record, the length of Africa. Uh, it's a 6,000 mile route. And um, I was training with the, the Scottish Development Squad. And um, so there was me sort of mid 30s with all these pesky 18 year olds trying to keep up with them on the track and making a fool of myself. But ultimately, you know, uh, learning a lot. There's, for the, for the cyclists in the audience, you'll get the fact that, you know, doing track sessions, doing power work, even if you're an endurance rider, you know, really stands you in good stead. Um, just your form on the bike, the leg speed, all the rest of it. So I was chatting to, to Mark, one of the coaches, and he was talking about taking the, the kids, they are kids, 18, 19, 20 year olds on uh, this route around the newfangled North Coast 500, and never heard of it before. And I said, what is this? And he said um, what it was, new touring route. I said, that sounds fantastic. Can you put me in touch with whoever's come up with this idea? The Route 66 of Scotland, as they called it. And it wasn't really launched. It wasn't really a thing yet. And it's amazing what it's become over the last six years. And um, so I came back fresh from the fitness of racing 10,000 kilometers down the length of Africa and had organized with uh, Tom Campbell and the team at North Coast 500 to come up with this film to launch it. And it was interesting because Tom said to me, look, could you do it over a week and showcase all the great scenery and all the great wildlife and food and culture of the north of Scotland? And I said, with due respect, Tom, if I make that film, another cheesy tourism film about Scotland, um, nobody's going to watch it. Uh, you know, you want a publicity stunt. Uh, you want me to just go and do it nonstop. So I got the, I got the team to make me a canary yellow skin suit and uh, which was pretty ridiculous for an endurance ride like that and uh, started at 6 a.m on the Monday morning and rode through till 8 p.m on the Tuesday evening just barely got off the bike and actually uh, whilst Jimmy joked that it was the middle of winter it might well have been I raced Africa 
in February, March. So I came back and I was still fit from that. And I think I did it at the end of April, beginning of May. So I thought I'll have like this time of year, the start of summer. And it was just biblical rain and just awful conditions up the West Coast. But um, it was a stunning route. And I got to go back and make a film for GCN with Cy Richardson a few years ago. And then I was doing a 3000 mile training ride around the coastline of Britain in the, in the, in the build up to the round the world the second time. So I kind of got to do it again whilst doing the coastline of Britain. And it's stunning. It's staggering each time, you know, you see it in a different way. But I do want to do it slower. You know, the three times I've done it, I've, I've always been going at two, three hundred miles a day. So it's a route that warrants, you know, a week and, and a proper explore. 100 mi- I tell you what, 100 miles a day around the North Coast 500 is hard, especially that West Coast. Like there's a, there's a stretch up to Loch Inver that I call the shark's teeth. And um, it's brutal. Some of the hard, everyone bangs on about the Biakinaban, Apple Cross Pass. That's easy. It's just, you know, find a gear and spin it out. But there's stuff further northwest that's, that'll test any bike rider. Yeah, 100 miles a day for somebody that's used to sitting 12 hours a day at a desk is, um, is a tall order. Jimmy, same question to you. Before I answer the question, Mark, you are dead on with that because see that bit of Loch Inver, I think I was about 18 hours in and that <laughs> almost broke me. I was like, why, why can't they just make a nice swooping bend instead of taking you down 25%, 90 degree turn, 90 degree turn, 25%. And it absolutely almost cracked me. That's, I was almost ready for putting, you know, fr- throwing the towel in at that point. But for me, it was a slightly different situation, obviously, to Mark. And everyone's got their own uh, different situations they have to uh, to play around with. But I, as I said, I was I was working with uh, one pro. So I was on the road quite a lot. So I was traveling an awful lot around, basically around the world, to America, all over Europe, um, uh, and ultimately Malaysia and, and, and Asia as well, just basically covering a race program. Because they were racing that way at pro continental level, which they basically got invites to lots all of the big races apart from the Tour de France and the Giro and all like the, the real top end world level races. But it's a very, very busy calendar. Um, uh, and basically what I would find I would do is I would pick three days of the week and I would decide to do 10 hours training each day. But what I would have to do is have to do it in sections. So I would get up in the morning at four o'clock, watch Mark's video, get my arse out the door, do five hours before I started work at nine, and then do all my check-ins. And then at lunchtime, I would either go to the gym, go for a run, or do another like indoor session on a, on a thing which had just came out called Zwift, you might have heard of. And then in the evening, I would go and meet Chain Gang or whatever. So I would get to the Chain Gang absolutely gassed. So I'd do that for three days to mimic 30 hours of, of real heavy, intense load, spreading it over like a massive time frame. And then it would basically take three days off because I was in the bucket. <laughs> that's pretty much how I would do it. There was other days where I would get up early. If it was a weekend, I would do four or five hours and then I would go and meet a group and basically get kicked up and down the, the east coast of Scotland by some of the best riders you can come across uh, for three or four hours. So ultimately, it was all about building resilience. And, and I think that the reason I touch on the fact that I did running and, and, and gym stuff as well was because... I knew that my bike wouldn't fail me. I had to make sure that my body wouldn't fail me. And it's not even from the point of view of having all that experience as a bike racer. It's silly things like your shoulder joints and, and your knee joints and, and even like your forearms and because you're in quite a compact position on aero bars, your neck has to be strong. So just building a really, really strong, healthy and, and resilient body was really the most important part of that. But it was funny, like being in Malaysia and go out and running around like the ghetto in Malaysia at like five o'clock in the morning before you went to managers meetings and stuff like that. So I've, I've done some quite interesting running around about uh, Asia and parts of America. I remember going to Park City uh, for the Tour of Utah and totally forgetting that I was at 2,000 metres altitude and nearly collapsing because I was <laughs> my body was unable to, uh, A, cool down or have enough oxygen for my brain. So uh, I came back from it flying, but unfortunately uh, it was too far out <laughs> from doing my record. But very, very different approaches, I think. But it just yeah. shows that if you, if you kind of science it a little bit and, and you can probably pull more into that now because there's way more we know way more about tech and cda and all that kind of cycling stuff but there's more you could pull off it potentially but at that moment in time you just did what you had to do ultimately and just make sure that your body was strong enough for for what you were about to do and then jimmy before we move on to talk a bit more about lockdown did, were you pacing yourself against mark's record were you conscious of that as you were going up did you have markers or how you know i, I had i had markers but I, I kind of, I had, I had a, a plan to so my head was always like, I want to try and go 30 hours. If I do 30 hours, then people have to donate money. I mean, come on, geez, give me a break here. You know, I've just kicked my arse around the North Coast 500. You need to 
dig deep into your pockets. And I had a bet with one of the founder members of One Pro, a guy called Simon Chapel. He said he would donate a thousand pounds if I went sub thirty hours, and I went twenty nine fifty seven. So I managed to get a few quid out of Simon. But the, the thing for me was I broke it into 100 miles and I, and I made the a, a, a loose plan was 100 miles in six hours. Usually when you race, you're doing that in four, maybe less. So I was like, do that. And then I made an absolute mincemeat of the first 100 mile and did it in four and a half hours and thought, oh no, I have made a massive mistake here. And then suffered for it basically 20 hours later. <laughs> You would do. And the cruel thing about the North Coast 500 is it's not 500 miles, it's about 520. Well, you say that because... The the killer. And it's a yeah. good point, that, because I was coming down the, the coast uh, past Golsby and I was looking at yeah. my, my K's and you know what it's like, Mark? I had like three Garmin's trying to make sure I would ha- had to register all so that we'd gone to Strava. Big battery pack in my pocket with a big clumsy USB cable poked into the bottom of it. And... Uh, I remember coming down and I was looking at the sign that was saying 20 miles to Inverness and I'm looking at, I'll, try, I'll, go, I'll go between K and miles per hour, so excuse me, but I'm looking at it and thinking, I'm short. How am I short? Have I cut that many corners in three, 400 miles that I've actually pulled 50 miles off that? That's not possible. And then my support car came across and said, remember, we have to go back into Muir of Ord, then come back out. And I was like, oh man, such a sense of relief. But I was also at that point where brain wasn't actually functioning that good at all rudimentary maths was not my strong point you go to you go into idiot mode don't you i mean it's there's not many people i mean i I love that i love riding through dawn that's one of my favorite times to ride when you've made the effort and you ride through dawn into the day it's magical or or night riding i'm a huge fan of night riding but the idea of actually riding through an entire night you know your circadian rhythm when you're trying to switch off and and then you sort of reboot new day but you've not actually slept it just it does does very strange things to you incredibly euphoric and incredibly emotional it's probably two of the the yeah. biggest emotions are uh, the biggest things that I, I found from doing that i have been in some pretty horrible places in bike races but i was in a pretty horrible place for a long time during that that's for sure i can imagine it was doubly emotional given the reasons why you were doing it as well, Jimmy. Um, yeah, yeah um, ab- absolutely. And that, but that was also a, a massive asset as well. But also one of the main reasons why I went so stupidly quick in the first 100 miles because I was literally all the way out to Muir of Ord. I was kind of fighting back tears because I was like, this has to happen today. I've got no other day of the year. It needs to be today. I need to get this done because two days later, I was working at the British Championships. So you can imagine how much fun I was when I was <laughs> doing team meetings at that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it just had to be done. And yeah. I think that was pretty much the, the reason I got through it. But would you not say, Jimmy, like, because because it doesn't matter how fit you are, how strong you are, I don't care what your FTP is, by the time you've ridden 300 miles, 400 miles, you hurt like hell. And it's more about your nutrition, your fueling strategy. Yeah. You know, at that endurance pace, you can keep going. It's amazing what the muscles and you know, your physiology can cope with if you fuel effectively. Not normally a, a sort of a, a mental crisis coincides with a nutritional crisis. So, you, you know, if you, if you, if, if, if it's all going to pot and you just cannot stay on the bike, then have some food and then see, see if that changes your opinion on the world. But, but clearly if yeah. you, if you mentally give up, physically you give up. And when, when you're 350, 400 miles into a bike ride, um, it's very hard to not fixate on the finishing line, but it still feels like it's a long, long way away. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really bizarre where your mind goes. I and mean, when I feel you sort of go into idiot mode where, you know, you're very, very, you're sort of observing the world passing you like a slideshow, but you're very, very much sort of focused on the very simple processes of, you know, fueling, changing positions when you can, when you just yeah. can't tolerate the suffering anymore, your lower back or whatever, and, uh, and, and just trying to think your way through the task. But really, for me, once it gets into the double century plus, it's all about the head game. Yeah, you mentioned nutrition. I, I was kind of off food after about 10 hours, and the team were trying to make everything and anything they could. And basically, any time I would put food in my mouth, I was like a two-year-old. I was like, no, I can't eat that. can't eat that. I was scraping food in my mouth. But when you talk about the thought process the biggest thing i did was that i just tried not to think i just yeah. done now and just focused on what I was doing at that point point. Uh, and for me i think if you are sitting out to do a big challenge i respect if it's 50 miles 100 miles or 500 miles just focus on what you're doing and the now it is so important because you can get so far away from yourself because we actually thought because i went so quick in the first hundred we could do this in 24 hours wrong so yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
I think, <laughs> I, think, I think the reality is you can't actually ride 500 miles. You can just ride the road in front of you. And I think that metaphor is useful in work. It's useful in anything in life. You can almost always ride the road in front of you. It's the, the fear of the never endingness, the battle of attrition that happens with the sheer scale of projects, which really makes people stop and fail. It's not actually the fact that they practically can't do the bit they're doing right now. I think anyway, there's yeah. definitely a parallel to be drawn with lockdown there. You know, as you kind of get towards the finish line of the exit, you know, vaccines, et cetera, that last stretch is, is going to be, you know, arguably the hardest bit to deal with. Um, but uh, there's some good questions coming in on the chat function that actually tie in with some of the points that you were talking about. Some nutritional questions there. Um, uh, how many calories do you need to consume when you're cycling such a distance? And you know, maybe tied into that, how many energy gel, gels were consumed during your North Coast 500 or do you not use those types of things? I, I could probably translate it into Percy Pigs. <laughs> so, Percy Pigs, uh, I think one of my sponsors, Infocrank, is a power meter company. They, um, um, they did a, an, info, an infograph and they said that it was the equivalent of something like 3,450 Percy Pigs. So a lot of Percy Pigs. That's a lot of Percy So it's, it's easily in excess of about 20,000 calories, I would have said. But the, I, think, I think the reality is when you do ultra endurance racing and riding like this, uh, you're in deficit. So it's not really about what calories you need. It's about what calories your body can process. So you can pile in food all day long, but can your, can your body make use of it? So not just the quantity of food, but how readily available the energy source within that is. So if you're doing a short sportif, you can kind of wing it and get away with eating gels and bars and eating rubbish. Whereas when you do ultra endurance, uh, most people fail on ultra endurance. And it's the same with mountaineering, not because their legs give up, but, the, but their gut gives up. As you get really tired, the blood flow sort of stops working in the upper gut in particular and sort of goes fight or flight. We need to somehow, you know, it's why you go into idiot mode. I think the, 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 the blood drains from the brain as well. But my point is, well, as you go into super big distances, I find that all the things you think you'll want to eat, you don't want to eat. And you, you actually go to more of a savory palate because the, the, you get taste fatigue really quickly. So all those lovely sweet electrolyte drinks, the, the, and they all become pretty, pretty yucky. So I always think like for ultra endurance, wraps are great. I know it sounds boring, but a wrap is basically a protein wrapped around a carbohydrate. And you want to be more fat adapted when you're going ultra endurance. So you want some, you want some pretty straightforward fats in there because you're, you're, you're slow release energy. You're not, you're, you're not actually wanting to live off jelly babies because that will get you through six hours, 12 hours, but not, not days and days and days and days. Yeah. yeah totally um, just, just, just talking about as, you know, as we come out of lockdown, Mark, I saw you were up in Sutherland, um, uh, which is presumably your first trip post lockdown. What were you, what were you doing up there going back to the scene of the crime for the North Coast 500? Yeah, yeah, I was up uh, a week past Friday. Uh, it was wonderful to to actually travel up. I was asked to open a distillery uh, in in uh, Brora. It wasn't Brora Distillery. That would have been very nice. Brora Distillery's got its own helipad, and so there's a certain price tag that comes with uh, their distillery, their um, whiskey. Um, uh, Klein Leash, which is just across the road, have just invested heavily in the visitor center and. I got to go up and of a Friday afternoon, look around the new distillery and drink whiskey cocktails at lunch, which is uh, always good fun. Um, but it was just amazing to, after, I used to treat Edinburgh Airport like the local bus stop. I used to travel for half of my life. And uh, I'm not feeling sorry for myself, but we're all in this together. In the last year, I've suddenly, you know, not gone anywhere. And um, just the, the simple pleasure of getting in the van driving up the a9 seeing that beautiful countryside change and then and then meeting people who were so excited to see tourism coming back to the north of scotland you know incredibly excited about what's happened in terms of sort of the new employment and supporting the local suppliers and the whole hospitality food and beverage industry that it uh, it sustains it was really, there was a sense of excitement because I got there the week before things opened up again. And um, it was just so nice. I mean, I got to meet lots of people who had traveled up from, from the whiskey company, from the, from the press. But the conversations I enjoyed the most was, was the people from the village of Brora who have worked there for generations and, you know, now felt like the world was about to, to start again. And, and it was good fun. So that's, uh, that's great. Um, and also in social media, uh, one of the things that I think I've noticed about you in particular, Mark, over the 
the past years, you've been promoting local adventures in a big way. And I, I'm sure you did that as much for your own sanity as to inspire others. But what, what discoveries have you made on that front? Well, I, I live um, I live in live in Edinburgh down uh, in Trinity, down near the water. I mean, we're pretty lucky for a city of half a million people with the Pentlands on our doorstep and the water on the other. It's a pretty cool adventure playground. We couldn't leave our council. And so um, I came up with this concept of, well, we don't really know where our council is. It's such an arbitrary line. So I try, I looked up a the, the, the GPX routes of all councils in Scotland and then tried to find the tracks and trails that were closest to the edge. Because I thought this concept of explore your boundaries, what's the furthest I'm allowed to go? Not being mischievous, but what's the furthest I can go without getting into trouble? And um, and and that was the, the so the, the, the boundary loop of, loop of Edinburgh is about 120K. And so I went and explored that in my gravel bike in the snow, actually the first time, and it took 13 and a half hours and then went back when the snow had melted and time trialed it in six and a half. And I just set it as a challenge, created, created a collection on Kamut with, uh, with all the, uh, the, the council boundaries of Scotland. Now, if you live in the Highlands or Ayrshire, then they're certainly not single day rides, but, or Perthshire where I grew up, but, um, but lots of them are. And um, it got a really, really great engagement because that sort of concept of explore your boundaries wasn't just a physical go out and ride your bike and see the familiar and unfamiliar ways but it was a bit of a metaphoric you know you can still have adventures you can still explore what you're capable of uh, even though we can't go far and the, and the one I really enjoyed last year was the kids were suddenly at home I've got two daughters aged seven and four and um, I was listening to a podcast with an American ultra runner who'd run across America and then said, well, I don't, didn't really know my own community. So he decided, despite being a wilderness fell runner, decided to run every single street in San Francisco, which is basically a seven mile block. And it took him quite a while. And I thought that sounds amazing. So I said to my daughter, Harriet, who was six at the time, let's just go and run the roads of Trinity. And um, so she cycled and her little Isla bike and I was running and we just went for an hour an hour and a half and it's really interesting if you go for a run or a cycle and you don't just do a loop but you actually try and do every road it becomes a puzzle uh, of trying to do it most efficiently without going back on yourself so I got home after that first day and I was like oh that was hopeless colored in the roads but realized I'd done a lot of it twice so then I planned it from then on in and it took us three months and we went out most days five six days a week uh, an hour, an hour and a half a day, her and her bike, me on my, uh, on, on, with my trainers on. And we ran and cycled together every single street in Edinburgh. So it was 506 miles. And we got the A to Z of the city and colored in every single street. But, you know, I've lived here for a long time now. And I thought I knew Edinburgh. But actually, when you're forced to run every single street, every community, places where your friends don't live, you get to see home in a very, very different way. But I also got to spend a hundred hours talking to my daughter. You know, at a time where I was really worried about work, at a time where I was a bit stressed about lots of stuff, I just, you know, I just had a hundred hours chat to a six-year-old about the, the world we live in. And um, it was good fun. And I didn't do it because I thought one day I'll come on an event and talk about it. I did it just because it was a, a way of coping with what was, what was happening. And Jimmy, so it's a similar question to you, um, you know, in particular in terms of athletes that you look after as well. How have you helped them, you know, cope with adventures in their own area through pandemics and all the rest of it, not being able to compete, that type of thing? Yeah, it's my role kind of changed quite quickly from being the, the person who gives you the training schedule and you chat to and you check in with once or twice a week to being pretty much uh, an unqualified psychiatrist basically for a lot of athletes but a lot of them basically had ideas like there's like, there's challenges similar to what Mark's saying there locally some of the local lads by us I live in Linlithgow and we have a thing called the marches in Linlithgow so they decided to do a boundary of West Lothian so we did that in winter solstice a few others were trying to do a K2 challenge which is 2000 meters uh close to me in the Bathgate Alps uh there was also quite a few of the lads down um down in, in the borders of mountain bikers they were doing the same so they would do like 2000 meter climbs not on the same climb not descending the same climb but really really again exploring all, all, all those sort of little things you don't you, you just where does that go where does that go but one of the funniest things that i actually came across was i was uh, out mountain biking one day in b craigs and i was coming down one of the mountain bike trails to meet a family of five pushing uh, a buggy uh, two dogs 
uh, two children and obviously the parents uh, coming in the opposite direction to which I had to alert them that if they kept on doing that, they would be uh, they're actually putting uh, the NHS <laughs> in danger. So uh, coming across people, it was actually really nice because you're out in the middle of nowhere and I've, my salvation is always is the trees. If I'm having a kind of rubbish day, I go for a walk in the woods or I go for a run or a ride in the trees. But it was really, really nice to actually come across people outdoors, exploring families, going down to the beaches locally at Black Ness. Um, okay, it's not Barbados, but it's somewhere kids can pick and find shells and, you know, doing hunting for different kind of leaves with my little one and just taking her out. And we, we do things, we go for like Gruffalo uh, hunt, hunts. So up in the, the up in the forest at Bee Craigs, there's always loads of these tree stick kind of uh, little huts being made. So we would always go and look for Gruffalos and stuff like that because she was, she's only like five or six at the time. So it's uh, really cool to do that. But for myself, it was again, it was kind of joining up like what Mark was saying. So we've got loads out here, we've got loads of gravel paths we're lucky we've got the right to roam in Scotland, so responsibly. But we, we were we came up with all these little routes, and again, pulling together different routes was really, really cool because one minute you're on like a perfectly nice paved road, the next minute you're up to your knees in mud, climbing through a fence, getting chased by a farmer off his land because you shouldn't be on it properly. But, uh, but for me, it was really cool from the, the aspect of just seeing people engaging and being outdoors. It was just so cool to just see paths that you never thought anyone knew about and suddenly they were becoming more beaten and more beaten and now they've, they've changed forever. So I think for me, that was one of the things that really opened up my eyes. Um, even just going for walks on the little one around by us, we found a few little paths and stuff like that. It's It's been really good to connect back home because because like Mark, I, I, I spent my whole life as an athlete living out of a suitcase. And then I went to work in sport that I was still part of and I was getting living out of a suitcase, but it's been really nice to be around and be a dad to you know be a proper dad and be around and do the school drop off and do the school pick up and and moan at her for leaving all our toys out and all that sort of stuff which I would have missed if, if I'd been away traveling so from that point of view it's been really nice to connect locally with my, my local roads my local trails my local community but more importantly with my family. Well, hopefully you both agree that drinking in your garden counts as an outdoor pursuit as well um but yeah. uh just on that note we've obviously you know there's been quite a momentum developed of you know outdoor life because of covid and you know, things like having to socialize outside how do you think we keep that momentum going for a healthier more outdoor lifestyle long term um yeah but big question i mean there's a lot of money going into cycling at the sort of policy government level, you know, we've got Glasgow 2023 happening, um, but 80% of that budget uh, at the government level is about what they're calling transformational behavioural change as opposed to um, the competitive uh, days of sport. But I think there's only so much that can be led by government policy. Um, I do think in the, the infrastructure and um, people feeling like they can get out safely on the roads and the tracks is, is, is really important. So there's the cultural piece, there's the infrastructure uh, piece. But I think a lot of it is just about people's individual choices. And um, hopefully the last year has given people more time to think about their own personal health and well-being. There's definitely a shift to, to, to home working, uh, which uh, promotes more flexible, you know, work-life family balance. Um, and I think a lot of people don't like to pioneer these changes and I completely respect that. We're all creatures of habit. So um, you do, whether you like it or not, assimilate what you see around you. And um, we can we can sort of keep talking about these important to uh, subjects, make sure that we lead by example so that we're not just telling our kids to cycle, but we actually go and cycle with them. And, and for businesses, making it as easy as possible for people to keep you know, their own well-being and and mental and physical fitness. I mean, this is is it this week or next week that's sort of well-being week. And it's interesting that there's there's days and weeks and tags for everything now. Um, you know, well-being week, I mean it's great that there's a, a a spotlight on that this week, but um, you know, it's such an ongoing perpetual thing. I had a big accident three weeks ago where I ended up in hospital for two days. And it's only when your health uh is impacted that you suddenly realize what's important in life you know we spend our life stressing about this that and the next thing but the moment you get ill or the moment you do yourself a serious injury or your kids or your your wife or your partner it's 
is your health that matters most, your mental and your physical health. So you can continue to have a positive impact on the people that matter most to you. That's it at the end of the day. Yes, there's financial security and, you know, making a positive impact in the world. But ultimately, you can't do any of those things if you're not well in and of yourself. So I, uh, there's been a lot of issues over the last year in terms of personal freedoms. But um, I do think we've all been given pause for thought uh, in terms of what, what, what our priorities are. And it's up to all of us to, to hold on to that. Just picking up on that theme of uh, health and well-being, and it ties in with, I think, at least one or two of the questions in the, in the chat function. But Jimmy, athletes choose to put themselves through mental and physical torture and they can stop any time they wish or, or so I think but lockdown and the, the personal freedoms that were restricted uh, that came with it were imposed on us. C can you compare the two at all and um, does your career as an athlete make things easier or harder to deal with when something like that's forced on you? Uh, I think it, the perspective totally changes on suddenly the whole reason for your existence almost is taken away from you and you're not able to express yourself and you suddenly had the project pulled away from under your feet at the last minute and then constantly the goalposts are moving so first lockdown we thought well it's maybe not going to be too long a year and a half later we're still here so it's like it's really about realigning people and going right what can we really focus on right now that's going to make a difference to you in back then a couple of months time so for a lot of people it's taking it back to basics and this sounds ridiculous, but for a lot of for a lot of athletes, it's about schedule. It's about having a plan for the day. And some of them were great. Some would be like training 10 o'clock in the morning, blah, 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 do this, 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 this. Some of them literally, you were like 7 a.m., get out of bed, 7.05, brush teeth. And it was literally like a format like that one because they were just, they just felt so helpless. And again, you're right that they, they, you do have that sort of mentality where push, push, push. But I think a lot of them realise really, really quickly that the resilience, they were already at a point where they pushed through a really difficult winter and they were really ready to start racing. And the, the season is always the reason why you're getting up in the dark of winter and going out training in the snow and the freezing cold. If you've definitely not got the luxury of being able to travel um, abroad, which obviously before this lockdown we did have. But for a lot of them, they don't have that at all. Um, so they were like, what am I going to do now? They felt absolutely useless and worthless. So you were trying to reinstill basic human behaviours back into people who are incredibly driven. And the, the issue was never um, that they didn't want to train. The question is, why am I training? And you always found that they were like, oh, I want to do this, 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 and this. It's like, but you have to be careful with that because what happens if that gets pulled away again? So I was always kind of holding them back a little bit, keeping them back at the basics, trying different strategies and different interventions to develop them as people more than anything. And I, and I think a lot of them have came out of it a heck of a lot stronger than they went into it. And you, you'd be silly to think that everyone's went through it, you know, being all right, I've floated through it. We might think we've floated through, but we've I've definitely had moments where I've had incredible lows and then had incredible euphoria all over the shop, literally being bipolar. And, and, and athletes are like that most of the time. We, we hang on to these big highs, but after that big high, there's usually a massive low. And it's and Mark can probably attest to that after he's done his, his 78 days around the world, breaking the 80, 80 days record. The next day, you're sitting in your house going, what am I going to do next? And I've had that after major games and major events where you literally you have that almost like a depression afterwards. But for, for those athletes, it was about daily check-ins making sure that we're doing what we're setting out and having to really sometimes change things in an instant because I wasn't able to do one-to-one -one work with them. I wasn't able to be on the track with them. I wasn't able to be in the gym with them. So everything was like this on a screen. And even as a business, from what I do, we had to change totally what we do, like like you guys have. We've had to adapt really, really quickly. And I think it's for, been forced upon us for sure. But I think that the fact we've got technology now has just made it so much easier. And mm. If we didn't have that, I would have said that we would have lost a lot of athletes, but potentially just a lot of people in general would have maybe not had great times. And I think although we get Zoom fatigue, it's still great to sit here and look on a screen and see other faces and see people nodding and people smiling and having a bit of banter because, hey, we're here for a good time, not a long time, as Colin McRae says. Eh? Yeah, that's, that's great. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, and I think, Marcus, I, think was, I, just, I, just, I just want to pick up on that sort of like, 
the empathy piece over the last year has been difficult when you're not meeting people face to face. I've noticed it over the last couple of weeks when you're actually meeting people. Um, I mean, you can joke about it. And I met somebody I'd had six Zoom calls with and uh, thought I knew them because they sat really close to the camera. I thought they were massive and I turned up and they were tiny. Uh, but, you know, we, do, we, can joke, we can joke about these things. But, but the empathy bit is very hard to, hard to get on a, on a Zoom call. And, you know, I saw it written quite well a few months ago when somebody who was obviously annoyed with this whole, oh, we're all in the, we're all in the same boat together. Whereas, you know, clearly we're not. Um, you know, some people have got, you know, big ocean growing cruise liners that they could sail through the last year and a half. Others are in little canoes and, uh, you know, whatever the analogy works for, for, for the individual, we've all had to, um, I think it's created change for absolutely everyone, for sure. But um, the realities that we've been facing are, are acutely individual. They're not, uh, the, the, you know, it's, it's something, it goes back to your original point, Scott. This has happened to us as opposed to a hardship that we've chosen to do. And I think if you take athletes like Jimmy and myself, we're quite good at knuckling down and suffering well when we choose to do that. But I can't compare rowing the Atlantic Ocean or cycling through the Sahara Desert to, you know, how do you sit at home and not not fight, not, not do something active, not choose to. So how do you put control back into a situation which has been imposed on you? I think that's been the, the big change. I've been asked by so many companies in the last year to talk about resilience because you're good at resilience, Mark. And I, I do point out that it's a slightly different thing. And you try and, to Jimmy's point, try and grapple back a, a sense of control when that is taken away from you. And, and as Jimmy says, structure, structure is one of, one of the best ways of doing that. And, and I think the phrase been... I heard was, um, we're all in the same boat, but the storm around us is all very different. That's what I heard the other day, and I thought that was pretty good, actually. Yeah, that yeah. is good. Um, as, as lockdown interested you, you talked about um, Zwift there, Jimmy, and, and you know, and Zoom calls with your athletes and all the rest of it. I think tech is, you know, if we didn't have the tech that we have now from a business perspective, we wouldn't have been able to function nearly to the same extent. But from uh, your perspective, you know, Mark, in terms of the the, the role that you have, how has social media worked for you over lockdown and, and other tech and, and, you know, what's been positive, what's been negative about that from your perspective? I mean, it's been, it's been mainly positive. I mean, I'm just thinking if COVID has happened 10 years ago, I think the government's reaction would have been entirely different because we couldn't have homeschooled the way we did um, work couldn't have um, carried on the way it is. So, so let's not get into a conversation about government policy around lockdown, but I just don't think practically we could have had the same societal reactions than we did because the technology just weren't there 10 years ago. Um, last year, one of the first things that I pulled together was an event uh, called World in a Day, where, which was I'd run this event out on the road where we went from Macrahanish to Aberdeen, so Argyle to Aberdeen. And the concept was to get 80 riders to ride 240 miles. 240 miles is the distance that you have to do every single day to cycle around the planet in 80 days. So the idea of it was, can you ride one day of what it takes to get around the world? If we can get 80 people to do it, then we've gone around the world in a day. But we'd done it for real, got everyone to put a grand in the pot, uh, raised 80 grand. And then I thought when COVID struck last February, I thought, could we do a similar thing to for some frontline charities? And um, created an event, didn't cap it at 80. We got hundreds of people turning out each week and we ran it each Thursday for, I think, six weeks. And it did raise a lot of money. But... I think what was much more powerful than the fundraising was sitting here on your turbo for like, can you imagine this, a 14 hour Zoom session. So the fact that you're on Zwift or not didn't really matter. It was the fact that we had this community, what I called a virtual peloton of riders from across the UK doing something genuinely hard. It was incredibly hard. There's 240 miles on the road is hard. 240 miles on the turbo is just torture and then to inspire you know each week two to three hundred people to give that a go the best thing i got off the back of that event and clearly social media and technology facilitated this was a sense of purpose everyone that got involved in that yes the fundraising was important and we got some great feedback from the charities but it was more a sense of this is so important to do something difficult genuinely hard during a period where we're being told just to sit at home and sit on our hands like it was nice to have something to fight against and something which actually connected people. So, so, so the technology and the social media part allowed that to happen. And, uh, you know, 
it, it was it was fantastic and probably one of the, the the most positive things that that came off the back of just that period of massive uncertainty and just um, I suppose that also picks up on a theme of motivation and ties in with a, a question that David McDonald has asked so just to to put that to, to you Jimmy you know when you've, you've achieved something like you know a medal at the Commonwealth Games how do you motivate yourself for a new challenge if it's, you know, particularly if it's not quite as challenging as, you know, raising that, you know, setting that type of bar? I think now I'm trying to motivate myself to be the, the best old guy in the group that I'm usually training with or just trying to keep up with the young lads or the young girls nowadays. But for me, it's, uh, I've been quite a progressive kind of bike rider. Um, I now spend a lot of time off-road. I do a lot of mountain bike races. I do a lot of long endurance mountain bike races. And for me, it's, literally the swapping out because when I was riding professionally I was never allowed to do any off-road events because the team would have had a fit I remember going to Xscape in Glasgow on my birthday to go down the really small learner slope and I literally got a phone call from the the guy who owned the clothing company Rafa that sponsored us saying uh, what are you doing why are you doing that we don't we don't pay you to do that and then got fined for on my birthday for going and having a, a nice wee treat with my wife but the thing for me now is that because I had never had that ability to do that, I'm now really into almost like Mark and I are kind of going like that. I love the ultra endurance stuff. Last year we did like a, a 300k off road, uh, like summer solstice uh, ride uh, locally. And for me, it's really about new challenges. Um, I've done the, the racing part. I've done the track and the road part. I want to do more stuff off road. I want to do the, the Badger Divide in Scotland. I want to do all these really cool things, which now are incredibly fashionable, which is brilliant. I've got a few events coming up this year. I've got, I always do the Glentress seven hour mountain bike race. We've got, hopefully I'll be going to Switzerland to do a six day mountain bike stage race over there with one of my mates who's 61. So I'm his chaperone basically with his Zimmer frame in case he needs it halfway around <laughs> or to get a, 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 a lead on the back to drag him up the hill. But in all honesty, he's, he's ridiculously fit for a 61 year old man who, he tells me that every day I ride about with him. But um, for me, it's just about new things. I think I've been in the sport now for uh, 31 years and I've seen a lot. I remember when it was a black art, it was literally, there was not, being a professional cyclist wasn't a thing in the UK. Then being part of that whole group of riders who suddenly became Chris Boardman and then our records with Graham Bree, and then with the Tour de France, you have the jerseys with Chris and then suddenly... Brad and everyone, it just it's just snowballed. And to be able to live through that has been really, really cool and really inspiring. But for me, it's like the sport now for me is I don't want to go back and race in a road race in Scotland because I've done them all. I want to do new things. I want to do things which are going to push me, my, my resilience and, and my mental strength because I also want to be quite a cool dad and have some really cool stories from my grandparents as well. I'll probably never compete with Mark from that point of view, but I'll, I'll try my best. That's great. Um... Thanks, Jimmy. We're, I think we're just, I'm just conscious of time and uh, just looking at some of the questions there. Um, and so for each of you, Julie asks a good question. What, what are you currently training for? Uh, is that to both of us? Yeah. Uh, currently, I was meant to be doing a Land's End John O'Groats uh, relay film for um, Global Cycling Network at the end of April, but I had a, a DIY accident and smashed my uh, finger in six six places. So I, I was off the bike for 18 days. I'm back on the turbo and um, I'll get back out on the road on Saturday. That'll be a real test for it. I'm off to see the surgeon tomorrow, but it was a real mess. Um, so we've put that back. So my first proper event is early June. So four weeks from now, if I can come back from major plastic surgery and smash a 850 mile, um, you know, end to end. That'll be cool. And then uh, in August, I've got GB Giro, which is a 2,000 kilometer uh, gravel uh, race the length of Britain, all in all in the UK. Excellent. That's a mega event. I remember watching Lockie Morton do that, and it was ridiculous how quickly he did it. Uh, personally, I kind of touched on a few things just uh, uh, when I was chatting that previous question, but for me, it's uh, for some reason, I turned 42 the other week, and I was like, I want to get back into racing. I'm missing it. Um, so I'm doing quite a few off-road races uh, and I'd like to try and go under 20 hours for the Badger Divide at uh, some point in the summer as well. I think currently it's about 24 hours, 23 hours. But I'd like to do something just something silly again. I like to have a silly thing on my list of things to do every year, which I'm sure resonates quite well with Mark. But 
other things, uh, I had a ludicrous idea of trying to qualify for the 2023 Worlds for the Mountain Bike Marathon Championships because it's local. Probably not do it, but hey, how else am I going to do it to get out of bed in the morning? So we'll see. Great. Well, I wish you both luck in, uh, in those endeavours. Um, one final question which came in from uh, Andy Todd at Springfield. Um, for, for Mark, um, given COVID, um, are we seeing the end of long distance cross country races or challenges? Do you think anyone will be able to race the world again, uh, at least in the next few years? Or if we can, whether the, the border delays will mean that records will never be beaten? I'd not thought about the border delay piece, to be honest. Um, last year, there was three women trying to break Jenny Graham's round the world record. The female, it's quite cool that we've got uh, the male and female circumnavigation world record, both held by Scots at this point. Um, and so I think there's definitely some contenders for the female record as soon as um, travel's allowed. I've not heard anyone um, say that they're going to try and break my record yet. I'm sure it will happen. You know, records are there to tumble. And um, the only other person I ever heard talking about whether it was possible to go sub 80 was the great late Mike Hall. Um, I've never heard anyone else before I went for it say that that might even be possible. And it, it does become an interesting topic. And I know we're running out of time because you know, I went 240 miles a day every single day for two and a half months. Uh, I rode my bike from four o'clock in the morning till half past nine at night, slept for five hours. It was absolutely brutal. You know, it's not the most fun bike ride I've ever done. Could you go quicker? Sure. I'm six foot three and 90 kilos. I'm not the best bike rider in Edinburgh. Uh, far from it. And Jimmy will tell you that. Um, but uh, I, I, I do know how to suffer. I do know how to do the sleep deprivation. I do know how to motivate myself and keep going. So there's lots of ex-pros who could, on paper, break a record like this. It's no longer like the first time I did it when I was 22 and you could just, you know, leave university and go off and pedal around the world and get a record. On paper, it is possible, but it becomes about how little do you want to sleep? You know, could you sleep less, suffer more? It's, you're not going to break the record by another, you know, I broke it by 37%. You're going to break it by a couple of hours or days and the 80 days was such an iconic one-time prize you know who was the second person to run a four minute mile um the the to to go 77 days or 76 days you're gonna have to i mean that's a project that cost a lot of money i had 40 people working on my team it took two and a half years to plan and that was on the back of having done this professionally for 15 years so, so it doesn't, it's not just about being a good bike rider. You need to have a lot of things aligning to try and go faster. It'll happen, but I'll be fascinated to see how. I don't think it'll be about border crossings. I think it'll be a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, th thank you. Um, we're, we're, we're coming to an end just now. So um, I'd just like to thank our guests this evening, uh, Mark and Jimmy. It's been a real privilege hearing uh, some of your insights into how you've coped, adapted and changed as a result of the pandemic. Um, I hope that you as an audience have been able to draw some helpful parallels for your professional and personal lives as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank a number of people that helped with the event, particularly Lindsay Chalmers, Elaine Kramer and Susan McGrath at Burnus Paul, also John Rowley and Christine Liddell for their help and support. But most important of all, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to attend another virtual event. I hope it's been a bit different to the quizzes, et cetera, that we've all become accustomed to during lockdown. It's certainly been a different event for us. And I really hope that you'll be meeting your friends, colleagues and contacts at Burnus Paul in the very near future. So on that note, on behalf of us all at Burnus Paul, thank you. And I wish you a really pleasant evening. Hey, everyone. Look after yourselves. Thanks.